Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been a while, and uh, I read a blog from uh, the Android and Google people, and um, apparently they're able to send you messages if an earthquake happens. But the even more surprising thing is, if you allow them, they can get the sensor data from your phone and uh, take it back and analyze it. And uh, if you imagine, that's a lot of distributed sensors um, across the whole country. And it's a very interesting problem. I'm gonna run this again. It allows you to, um, to get very detailed uh, insights uh, of what is happening. Now, obviously, Google is a huge company with uh, apparently unlimited budget and probably they throw like a dozens of engineers um, at this problem. And um, so I thought like, hmm, that's interesting. And this is when my uh, hubris kicked in and I thought like, couldn't we build the same thing with Databricks? You know, just to have a cool demo and um, to show you guys and to, you know, use your phones as, as distributed um, sensors and uh, analyze the data together. Um, and I kind of like the idea because very often we, we talk about streaming data and we show people the syntax like, you know, that's the SQL to create a streaming table, but we never show streaming data. If we show streaming data, we often, you know, where do we get it from? We often need to do tricks. We have a big file, we cut it into pieces, throw it into autoloader, and it then picks it up as streaming data. That's okay. Um, but, you know, I wanted to have real streaming data. Um, and the other thing is, I think, like, we should do more demos where we do the real end-to-end, -end, meaning we start from ingestion, and then we not only say, well, that's the gold table, and now you can use it downstreams, but also, like, really share it to some other entity, include the sharing part. And this is how the whole idea started. Um, so I was trying to put this together, and um, talking about the demo, I want to focus on two different things. One is serverless, and the other one is obviously streaming data. Let me get over this. Uh, I think you have to watch it again. Just enjoy it. Um, <laughs> all right, so my name is Frank. I work um, as a technical marketing engineer. Um, I built a thing because I thought it's a cool demo. Um, we only have the Wi-Fi, so normally I'm hooked up with a, with a fixed line, so I'm separated from you guys. Um, we don't have this here, so that might be a bit of fun, but let's see how far we get. Okay, so um, I think both terms, like streaming data and serverless, they're kind of a little bit overused and, and kind of drawn into the marketing area, um, and that's why I want to give you a proper definition before we start. Um, streaming data is like, when I left uh, my home in Germany, um, I called a taxi, I speak to a voice computer, at the end I need to confirm that I want a taxi and the voice computer says, your taxi will arrive in four minutes. Then I leave the house, I stand outside, sometimes in the rain, sometimes the taxi is already there because there's a booth around the corner, and sometimes I wait for 10 minutes. So it's very uncomfortable, I get wet, I get cold. If I'm trying to leave Moscone here for the, for the party tonight, click on Uber, I see these tiny moving cars in what seems to be real time, and that's the streaming data um, advantage. Um, if you think about this, it's not like the talk next door where they talk about you know, petabytes of data. We don't need petabytes of data for this tiny dot, but the dot is moving, that's the, that's the interesting part, so it's continuously produced, it's maybe a few, not even kilobytes, maybe a few bytes only, and it very often comes with this expectation of, you know, we process the data in time. It's not like the traction control on my motorbike that needs to be, you know, microseconds, um, but, you know, if, if, if you see the car here, it should come around the corner at the same time. That's kind of the expectation. So very often it's not really about latency, but more about the programming paradigm, and I think you all know, like, this this comfort level that we have in Spark, like um, doing something non-streaming, like reading a CSV file with um, spark.read.formatcsv you know, is almost the same as reading from a streaming source from Kafka. So I think that makes sense to, to agree on what streaming data is. Serverless is actually even, even more exciting. I think there were like two interesting things. One is when really serverless came out with AWS Lambda. Um, nobody, nobody was expecting that. 
And then something really cool happened. Do you know this guy? Anyone knows him? Who is it? Yeah, Kelsey Hightower. He just, like, two days ago, he mentioned on Twitter that he's going to resign. He's going to, I don't know if he's retiring or just doing something else. Um, he did something really amazing. So he's the Google tech guy, the tech evangelist from Google. He was speaking at the Google conference in front of an audience like you, but probably 10 times bigger. And then he was, he was showing a tool, actually, to convert Kubernetes containers into serverless functions, into these, uh, yeah, yeah, serverless functions. And then he was like, so what is the gold standard for serverless? You know, him at the Google conference, and everyone was thinking, like, well, what are we supposed to say now? We had Google, you know? So everyone was quiet, and he was like, come on, guys, take your vendor T-shirts off and say it, say it. And then one, like you, he said, like, well, it's AWS Lambda, isn't it? Now, these tiny functions in the cloud don't make a lot of sense for what we want to do, you know, data and AI, or big data and AI, but they're kind of a good mental model to think about serverless. What do we get from them? Well, the first thing is, if you try such a Lambda function, you just provided code, even the easiest way in a web form, you give it some Python or Java or whatever code, and then it just runs. So there's no infrastructure that you see, no infrastructure that you manage. And then it also scales, like it scales to whatever parallelism concurrency you need, it just happens to be there and scales. Sometimes it doesn't happen to be there. At the very beginning, there was a big discussion about these cold start times. So it took a while until you could really run um, the first uh, instance. And to be honest, that's a problem of this technology. So even if we talk about serverless at Databricks, you will see that we have these you know, times until you get to the database, they go down over time. And sometimes I was talking to customers and they say, why are you doing this? Why does it take so long? And the answer is, do you think we do this with intention? No, obviously not. There's dozens of engineers working on exactly this problem in decreasing this, you know, the first the time to get to the first instance. The last one is you only, it scales. That's what I'm trying to say. It also scales to zero. That's always my first question. Does it scale to zero and does it mean that I stop paying um, then? So that's kind of the characteristics I want to see for serverless. Now, let me try something. This, so. How would we build such a system? You know, you have your phones, it's shaking, there's a massive earthquake, and then the data needs to be collected, it needs to go somewhere, it needs to be cleaned up, processed, and then some, you know, more or less live display should show, well, there's something happening. So this is not fake, this is really from my phone, because I'm shaking my phone right now. And how would you build such a system? Good question. Like, um, let me get to, to this one. Like, uh, actually all important systems, I think, are kind of designed on the back of an envelope. And I made such a design, and then I was trying it with an internal group. Some of them are sitting here, literally on the back of an envelope, just digital, and they were like, oh my god, this is like the, the coolest design we've ever seen. That's why I've redrawn it. Looks like this. What you see at the core. At the core, we have this DLT. Um, DLT is a product, so I try to match the products to what they really do. Um, so we have DLT here at the core um, for creating data pipelines. That's the preferred way of creating data pipelines um, in Databricks. It needs to support streaming. That's what it's built for, so it's perfect. Um, then what I want to do, I told you, you've already seen one of these, like, like that one. It's actually not that easy to visualize streaming data. You've seen this live data coming in from the right-hand side. That was the stream that was coming in. Um, how do you do something like this? Databricks notebooks and the display function are incredibly useful for this. I'm going to show you some other um, visualizations, and you have to carefully look if they're really I mean, updating or if they're just, you know, wiggling or swirling or moving around. Because sometimes, you know, it's easy to take a, a snapshot and then use Plotly and plot something, but it will never update. It, it's still moving because you can rotate it, but it's not updated. And the first easy way to get really um, visualization of streaming data is always a Databricks notebook. It's a display function. 
um, what was happening behind the curtains when you saw these bars coming in, I was running a Spark structured streaming job. Um, if you, did you hear the keynote this morning? Um, Ali said it has like one billion downloads per year, so it cannot be completely wrong. That's why I used it. What we need to do with um, Spark structured streaming is we need to provide those windows and then measure over those windows what changes. So streaming data, everything changes all the time. The only thing that we can measure is the change, and for measuring change, we need this, this timed window. So we were going this path, and then we ended up here in this notebook, and later I want to show you SQL dashboards, and we want to go, oops, that's too small, we want to go this way from delta sharing to something really outside of Databricks, time permitting. I have a small workflow, um, now, how about this left-hand side? I decided that from my phone, I want to put the data into Kinesis. Now, a lot of people say, like, why Kinesis? That's not even Databricks. Why would you use that? Well, answer number one is a lot of people do that. So from a Databricks perspective, we want to be able to integrate with these messaging system, messaging buses. And um, if you followed the blog postings that we did in the last couple of months, you've seen that we've published one that um, the Spark connector and DLT is now supporting Kinesis with the enhanced fan out. N normally in Kinesis, you have a, a throughput that depends on the number of shots that you have, um, but the throughput is for all possible um, consumers, and with the enhanced fan out, you get the dedicated throughput per consumer. It's actually a Kinesis feature, but it needs to su be supported um, on the Spark side. That's what we do now. We um, recently, the most recent blog posting was about PubSub from Google, so you can use um, DLT and, and Spark with PubSub. And oh, I spent almost one year talking about Kafka. Now the question is still, why did you choose Kinesis? And the answer is like, I spent so much time talking about Kafka, and Kafka is very bound to a cluster, although you know Confluent does it without a cluster. And I felt like I want to have something serverless because I'm talking about serverless, um, and Kinesis is fine. You never see the underlying infrastructure. You just say, I want that many shots. Um, here for this demo, um, I configured two shots. And then we have this IoT device, and that's your phone. And actually what's happened here, I can show you, it's also serverless, and that needs some explanation. Um, let me enable this. Go. Yeah, this is how the app looks like. The app is actually not an app, so if you want to play with me, and that's the thing I want to try with, with all of you, it's a single page web application, which is a single file, which is in S3, it's in a bucket. So the interesting thing is, if you think about those criteria that I defined for serverless, if you apply them to S3, you've never seen any file servers, you never had to you know, upgrade the storage in S3. You pay for what you use. So it's per definition serverless, and it's the kind of underlying, well, base technology that you use, that we use for the lake house and some of you um, use um, for data lakes. Now the cool thing is I have a blob in there, which happens to be this file, which, well, which um, basically does a kinesis put and write some data into Kinesis. Whenever you see this asterisk, that's one message that I'm sending right now. So if you count like 21, 22, it's like sending five messages um, per second. If I move it, you see it goes from green to, to yellow, and then if I move it more, it goes to red, and then, okay, so that's it. That's the whole thing. Cool. Um, Let's go to let's go to here. I'm going to show you the bucket um, where this file is. Um, it's right here. Um, it's not too interesting. Basically, what we need is the URL of this file, and then everyone can access it. Um, the the cooler question is actually how can the single page web application on the phone write to Kinesis? Um, the very uncool answer is you put the AWS keys into this app, which is like a disaster. I mean, that's as bad as committing them to, to GitHub. If you ever do this, we are not friends anymore. So if you do this and we meet next year, I'm not gonna recognize you. Now, what's a better way of doing this? There's a way of 
setting up um, credentials that allow you to access Kinesis only. Um, it's called incognito, it's an AWS specific thing. Um, don't worry about it. So these single pages can only put to this, well actually I think to this particular um, Kinesis stream and this is um, how I built it. it. Took me a while to figure that out but it's working now um, really nice. So the data comes from here, it goes through Kinesis. Whenever you build something like this, things go wrong, so you want to be able um, to debug this. And the first output that we can see is what is coming out of Kinesis. And um, there is a cool tool, which is this one here. It's called um, Kinesis Tail F. So it's like the tail that you know from Unix. And if you say, give me that stream, and the stream surprisingly has the name dice2023 in that region. And then it's written in Go. This is why I need to define that I want a line feed, I think. Without a line feed, it kind of changes everything. And you see, if I move that, it immediately moves. So the kinesis is like in and out. There's no delay at all. Um, so let's look at our data pipeline that we're using. So basically, I'm here now. So I showed you the output here. Um, I showed you this one. And now let's look at DLT. Okay. And where is it? It's here. It's actually running right now. If you look at this, and if I zoom in a bit, I have a view. This is why I ingest the raw data coming from Kinesis. Then because it's raw data, it's just a blob, you know. We don't really, um, it, there's no, last year I was doing a talk and ingesting data from Twitter, which was written to an S3 bucket in JSON, and then we could use autoloader and infer the schema here. I need to map the schema manually, and I can show you the code um, in a second. So it comes in here as a view. Um, it goes on as another view. A view is not a table, so the tables, they are persisted, but the views are not persisted. So why am I not using a, a table? Because I want to have this to happen as quickly as possible. If we persist, it at the end goes back to S3. Uh, there is a, a certain time that you need to write something to S3. I wanted to omit this time, and that's why I have a view here, a view here. And then at the very end, that's my gold table. That's a sensor table. It's a real table because I want to use it um, outside. And then I have another one, which is called um, global stat. And that's it. And then I have, you've seen that. And if I shake it again, it actually takes as long as the pipeline needs, but this pipeline is rather quick. Um, this is not updated, let me update this. This should jump now, okay, it jumped already to 5.8 thousand. All right, but if you see this updating, it, it like every two or three seconds, it updates because I set it here under settings um, to, um, to continuous mode. Right. Okay, I think this would be a good time to try the first time for yourselves. I was shaking it and it's, it's walking through like here. You see the maximum is like 17, 18, you get to 50, 60. Um, what is this notebook doing? I already told you it's doing Spark Structured Streaming, so that's the seismograph. Um, hope you like my mid-journey um, diagram. Um, you've seen the data already. It's a device ID that is generated as a UUID. So everyone gets a UUID. I don't know your names, I don't want to know them. I'm German, you know, GDPR and all that. Um, the other thing is, if you click on stop, it stops sending. If you move away from the page, it stops sending. If you close the browser, it stops sending. At the very beginning, it asks you to access the sensor data. If you say no, you cannot get to this data. It, it never sends. So there's many reasons not to send. Um, and only if you say yes, allow to use the sensor data, and then yes, um, send the data, it's sending. All right. What we're doing here, I told you the thing is, it's all about change over a certain period of time. So it's a delta table. Um, it's a sensor delta table. If you look at this, we have this um, catalog, schema, um, table name, um, three, um, three level um, naming schema. So it's a, it's a Unity catalog um, table. The name is sensor. I use a watermark for three seconds, that means um, it's not keeping state forever, but only for three seconds. Then I group it into one second windows, and over those one second windows, I average the magnitude that comes in. 
So I don't want to see like if you all play with me, I don't want to see like 80 different bars. I want to see the average of what you're able to do. And then I sort it, and then I show the last 30 one second um, things, and then it's moving through. Okay, I have one more diagram that I want to show you. Let me see where this went to. That's actually the new workspace. I don't know if you have seen that. So it's nicely arranged with, you know, the workspace files and the repos. Um, this is backed up by a repo. I have it on GitHub. If you like, I'm happy to share it. I have a histogram. Um, and let me see if this is running. I don't think so. So I run it. Um, so it's spinning up. It might take a bit. And then, yeah, this is where you see I'm... Uh, plotting a histogram because I thought like, I want to see all the IDs that you guys create, the UUIDs, um, and then don't shake it too much at the beginning. You know, if we start, we start slowly. Um, and then it's also showing the IDs. This is probably some of you already figured out the URL. Um, and it's, it's one of them is, is mine. So we should so many more bars like this if you start um, playing with me. Um, and then we can, we can get to this uh, maximum. Okay, now what you need is, is the following QR code. Where did it go? Damn. This one. This one looks good. If you want to play, can you scan this QR code? Don't do crazy things. We have a couple of rules. Don't forget that you're holding a piece of metal and glass in your hands. So even if we try and shake it a lot, um, make sure you don't, you know, you don't throw it away. Um, the most important rule is if you lose grip of your phone, don't throw it towards me. That's the most important rule, okay? Um, do you all get this code? I have them printed. I mean, I'm not sure if it works in the back row, but you all seem to be happy and <laughs> shaking phones. Um, let's go, oh, this is the live data coming out of Kinesis, isn't that cool? And this, ah, look at this. I've never seen it like this. Imagine, I was, you know, doing this for um, a long time, playing with this. Uh, woo! Wow, wow, wow. Can I take a screenshot before this is going away? This is so amazing, wow. Fantastic. Okay, now, I mean, what we do these days, we always do gamification. What does gamification mean? We should see like, I mean, this is just the statistics, the histogram of, you know, one of you did amazing 150, but gamification is you are one group and the group needs to perform really well. So what we do is we switch to the other view which is this one where, you know, the average here looks very average. Um, can you all try and not move it, like l really leave it to zero? Um, don't shake it. Uh, if you shake it too much, like you had too much party yesterday, ah, this is fantastic, so it goes down to, to zero. And now we do two groups. We do, we split here, like from my view, the left-hand side of the room, which is your right-hand side, is group number one. We wait until this is down to zero. And then you do like, I don't know, like five seconds maximum intensity. And I look at those five seconds and hang on, three, two, one, go. All right. Uh, okay, stop, that looks good. And now, as I told you, it's going through Kinesis. It's actually going through my account, then picked up in another account with DLT. It's going through DLT. Um, then it's um, picked up by Spark Structured Streaming, and then it should roll in here. Might take a bit longer if we have more um, clients, but we should see that. Let's see, ah, and there it comes. So which is the maximum? Maybe that one? That was 19, and that was, was 19 as well. Okay, so left-hand side, 19. Now we're not doing the right-hand side immediately because I have more that I want to show you. Um, talking about serverless before I forget, um, a few more things that I wanted to mention for DLT. One is I 
have the DLT pipeline here. That's the running one. If I click on source code, um, it's basically doing the, that's the pipeline, I hope you like that too. Um, it's basically doing this Spark read stream format kinesis. That's how we had to do it until now. So in DLT, you can choose between SQL and Python. Um, usually, even though I'm not a SQL person, I prefer to do it in SQL because it's easier. It's about data, it's a data pipeline, it makes sense. And then people say, when should I use Python? And there, there's been two answers so far. And one is, if you want to do meta programming, so there's a way in Python that you can build a loop, and in this loop you create a table. So you can create 100 tables if you want it, and you can create um, other constructs in, in DLT. So if you wanted to do that, you had to use Python. The other exception until now, and this has changed, that's the, the cool thing, is if you wanted to ingest from a message bus from Kinesis, PubSub, Kafka, you had to do Python as well. Because how would you do, how would you ingest from Kinesis or from Kafka in SQL? And now you can do it, we're just updating the um, documentation, but there's a way to say, you know, select star from and then Kafka, and then you define the, the parameters for the Kafka stream. So this first limitation, when you had to use Python, soon will not exist anymore. That's one announcement. The other thing is talking about serverless. Um, well, talking about serverless, DLT never used the clusters that you defined here under compute. DLT would always spin up and create its own cluster. And Michael was just talking and he said, look, we even have a very clever fallback strategy. We upgrade the DBR version automatically. We don't let you choose it. Um, if it fails for whatever reason, we can automatically downgrade it and restart the pipeline. There's a lots of built-in mechanisms that we don't see and sometimes don't even appreciate because um, we don't see them. Um, so it was never using that cluster anyway, and now we're switching to serverless. So soon you will be able, and that's a preview right now, you will be able to use DLT with serverless. What will change is if you go to, well, what will change in the first um, preview, what I can show you is, I can't show you here because this one is not enabled yet for the preview, but if you go to settings under compute, you would see these min workers, max workers, and I set it to three and six. Um, if you select serverless, it will be one tick mark, all this goes away. Remember when we defined what does serverless mean? I said, well, you don't manage the infrastructure or you don't even see it, and here it just goes away. It picks the best selection automatically, which makes sense because if you had to pick it, you had to measure and then select something, and these measurements change over time, so why not giving it to a machine? It makes a lot of sense. So DLT will be serverless soon. Um, the other thing that I wanted to show you is dashboards. Build a dashboard for you guys, and that's actually the other table. If you look at this table, I have a table here um, that is creating global statistics. It's not using a win node function, so it's not over time, it's just taking the global maximum, the global minimum, and then, um, where are we? We are here, and then it's displaying this. So it's 80,000 events, um, maximum magnitude 200. Oh my God, who did this? That's amazing. Um, average three, I get to zero or one normally because there's lots of zeros, and that's a dashboard. How is the dashboard running? It's actually running on a serverless data warehouse backend. Um, so I was for a long time like a, a developer and I always said like, you know, the only thing I want to see from a database is a JDBC URL. And then I had to fix all these, you know, these TNS names aura files because the database wouldn't start up and, and all these low level things. And I thought like, why do I have to do this? If you switch, if you have this serverless technology, the instances just spin up and you never need to take care of this. So I wasted too much time in my life to fixing these Oracle listener things, and I'm so happy that here, whatever I do, I select serverless, it's a serverless SQL warehouse, this is it, and it would spin up in a few seconds, and then it's like just working um, immediately, and that's fantastic. That's exactly what I want, being a non-database um, person. Okay, having said that all, we need the second group. Are you ready? Am I ready? That's the question. I am. All right, like here, this side. Let's do another five seconds. I'm counting, three, two, one, go.
Cool, that's it, thank you. Let's see. Do you remember what I said uh, for, the other, for the other group? I forgot. 19, okay, thank you. Takes a while, two, three seconds for DLT, not too long. The Spark trucks are streaming a little bit longer. If there's lots of people out, it, it tightly uh, more. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to do, and I'll show you this. This looks like, oh my God, you're so much better. Woo, woo. This is really good. What I wanted to do is point out of what we're doing here. Um, how many people are you playing now? Um, let's assume you're 100, and then I told you that you're doing like five events per second. That's per minute, that's per hour, and that's per day. And then let's assume you're not 100, but 120, and let's, why is it not? Okay, that's 51 million events per day. And the Spark Tracks is streaming one, it still has a one node cluster, but a single node cluster. Um, so a single node, and we do 50 million events per day. Isn't that amazing? Without any tuning, and that's like uh, Spark out of the box running on Databricks. All right, so you've seen um, most of the cool stuff that I wanted to share you. I uh, wanted to show you. I want to go back to the SQL editor and show you a bit more about Unity Catalog and um, data sharing. Um, what I can do here is click on data and then see the lineage from the um, pipeline. Now the lineage from the pipeline very much looks like the pipeline itself. It will be these two tables and you won't see those two because those are views and not tables. Um, so that's not a big surprise. It gets more interesting if we have more tables, and this is why I go to my editor, and what I do is I want to create a table A, uh, which is here, A depends on sensor, B depends on A, so it's B depending on A, depending on the sensor, and another one that I call my share, which is actually your high score. So it's like the device ID and the maximum um, for this device ID. Let's see if I can run this. That's actually now going against the uh, um, serverless backend, serverless data warehouse, and it's executing, it's running, and let's see, uh, looks good. It returns here those um, device IDs, 137, that also answers the question how many of you are out there. And now if I go to data, the first thing is I need to find my catalog, and I'm always like confused, and the thing that you need to do is used to find, so I type in my name, it's called Demo Frank, I open this, uh, we get to the schema, it's motion, and then we have the tables, and I click on, on actually I click on sensor, which is the last one, it's like the gold table from the pipeline, then I click on lineage, and I see the lineage graph, and that's the sensor table, and that's um, A going to B, and then I had this global stat not going anywhere, and then I have this my share table. All right, now, that's the whole graph. Now imagine we had more tables here. Like I was cheating a bit. Typically the table where you ingest data from, uh, from Kinesis, we make it a real table because Kinesis is not persistent. You would lose your data after a day or after seven days if you use Kafka. So we want to have a table where we just keep the, the incoming data without any magic, without any transformations, so we can go back to this all the time. And then you, you would see the whole lineage graph from the incoming data through the pipeline, through all dependencies. Now imagine this B table could be a table from the feature store, so it goes all the way from ingestion to the ML model, and you can track it back. You can do this on a column level um, as well. Now, the very last thing I want to do is use this my share table to share it. And what I want to do is, what's here? Let's take this away, let's close this. What I want to do is um, go to data and then go to Delta sharing. Now I have a share here, it's called Frank share because, well, my limited fantasy, and it doesn't have any assets. So what I can do here is I say, 
manage assets, add a table, and um, let me refresh this. Oh, select schema. Okay. Again, that's demo Frank. And that's the motion schema. Remember, those are the tables that I just created. Now I'm sharing the MyShare table. Um, oh, I knew it. There's a safe thing hidden. Um, and then I have recipients. Look at this. I already created a recipient. If you click on the recipient, it has a token. And this token is now, I already used it once, so it's kind of, I could continue to use it, but I want to show you the token. This is why I rotate the token immediately now, because we're running out of time, and I get this link. Now I use this link, copy the link, and now I go to, away from my Databricks instance, I go to a Google Colab notebook. So it's another cloud, my first part of the demo, all the Databricks stuff was on AWS, and what I don't want to do is share from AWS to AWS, because that's the old story, you know. That's what, what other companies tell you. We can share to other instances, just buy a second instance, pay the fees for that, and then we share internally. Everyone can do this. But I want to go from one cloud to another cloud, from one system, Databricks, to the Google Cloud. So this is a Google Colab notebook. And um, what I'm doing here, first of all, is I use this link, click on that, um, it says download credential file. Um, it's called config share two, which is a bit of a weird name. Uh, let me rename this to maybe config dice. I don't know, I don't have a better idea. Um, okay, and then we go back to this notebook. Now this notebook, um, that's the old run, by the way, um, is installing the Delta sharing library. And then it's, what was it, config dice, no? Um, I don't have it here. I need to import that file, first of all, which is here, config dice. Now I have it here, it shows up here. Um, I run everything and see how far we get. So it's importing the data sharing libraries, um, pip install. Then I look at this config dice share, Look at this, it says share credential. It comes with a bearer token, which is like pretty long. That's the thing you need to talk back to the Delta sharing server. And then where's the Delta sharing server? Well, we need to tell it, it's this endpoint. So use the bearer token here, talk to this endpoint. And then let's use this profile file. Let's create a client, which is Delta sharing client based on this profile file and list me all the tables. Now there's a table which is called my share in this share in this schema. And then there is this internal notation where I say, look, with this share and the my share table, um, load the data. So it's data sharing client load as a pandas data frame from this URL. And then I load it and I was plotting your high scores. And again, there was somebody doing, wow, 230. That's amazing. That's really, really good. Um, we have one more minute. There's one more thing I wanted to tell you, and that's workflows. Uh, workflows is here. If you click on that, I created a workflow for you. Um, Databricks workflows is giving you this matrix view. So one workflow run is this one. The workflow itself has two tasks. It's updating the dashboard that I was showing you previously, and it's then creating a heat map. So what server does it use? Is it serverless? And the answer is it's not only serverless, it's kind of double serverless. Let's look at the compute. It's using, for updating the dashboard, it's using the serverless data warehouse instance, and then it's using serverless to run the workflow itself. Now, the workflow's serverless story is a little bit like the DLT story when, when I said, look, DLT was like almost serverless because you never specified the cluster, but you could still see it. And now soon we're gonna run it on, on serverless compute. With workflows, the same thing happened. You never had to provision a cluster for the back end of, of, um, of Databricks workflows. We would just do that, run that, you know, somehow. I think we didn't, didn't even charge you for that. You only had to provide a cluster for your jobs, for your tasks. And now these jobs, these tasks become serverless unless they're going to a data warehouse and then they're serverless data warehouse anyway. So it's double serverless workflows. 
Um, it's in preview right now. I think the new default is if you create a serverless um, task, it will run here as um, serverless. All right, what we do, let's try it one more, the thing. Are you ready? Let me find the, where is it? Ah, no, that's the histogram. That looks good already. Damn. Let me go from here, open new tab. Um, that's the one we need. I think we do it all together. Can I take a picture of you guys? Is that okay? Just to show my boss that we had fun. He always says, what are you doing in these demos? All right, so is it running? Yeah, it's running. Um, some of you are moving. Okay, let's go. Three, two, one. Perfect, you can stop. Okay, let's see. Oh, this is so exciting. Now I know it's working. Now I'm not scared anymore. I was a bit scared when I did this. Like, uh, I had the one-way ticket to Antarctica in case this goes wrong. I'm so happy that I don't need it because I don't like cold weather. Um, and now it needs to show up. Oh, look at this. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I have one more slide for you guys. Um, please don't walk away without seeing that slide. Where is it? Um, first of all, I have a few more slides. I'm going to share them with you later so you get them uh, from the conference. The important one is please rate this talk if you liked it. Um, share it on social media if you want. You can get certified here at the conference for free. Um, so yesterday I just walked in and tried the data engineering exam. I didn't have a lot of time and I passed. Uh, so, so you will um, as well. You can have two tries for uh, certifications. Make good use of it. Um, we will share the slides. If you have any questions, I'll be around. I think we need to leave the room or stop here, but I'll, I want to walk away. If you have questions, talk to me. Thanks again. Please rate the talk. Thank you.